Back in April 2019, we did an expedition to do a double traverse of Europe's largest ice cap, the Vatnajökull in Iceland. The context of the expedition was to retrace the 1932 team's route and for their time they did some really interesting scientific work and what was relatively groundbreaking at the time. So in 2019, 87 years on, we wanted to continue in their spirit and do some equally interesting scientific work and so for us that was to understand the invisible microbial world in these extreme environments. We wanted to demonstrate that you could do this kind of DNA sequencing anywhere and in any environment. There were three of us on the expedition. There was Oliver Vince, whose idea it was to follow this 1932 team, myself running the scientific program, and then we had John Henry Charles, who's from Norway and who really likes cold places and pulling heavy things. During the expedition, it was a ski human-powered traverse, carrying everything that we needed on sledges, and included within that was our field sequencing kit, and that made everything really easy. Something small, light, and portable enough that we could take it to any environment, which fitted into just two small nine-litre boxes. To our knowledge, this is the first time that people have done entirely off-grid sequencing and by that we mean no backup generators, no backup internet access, doing everything completely sustainably and renewably. With all the reagents lyophilised, we had lots of fresh water with us. The difficulty was in heating your samples to 80 degrees, but we found that we could just use a thermos mug, fill it with some boiling water and a bit of snow to bring it back down and just use a normal meat thermometer to keep it at 80. We collected a soil sample from a hot spring gorge on the northern side of the ice cap and we thought this would be the most likely kind of sample to contain lots of uh, microbes and therefore DNA. So to extract that DNA um, we needed to use the Kyogen Power Soil Kit and the first hurdle was shaking the beads fast enough and we tried lots of different 3D printed um, little models that looked like small train engines that you could use a drill with to make it shake back and forth but none of that really worked that well. So in the end we borrowed a Terralyzer, which is an automatic hammer that's been adapted to fit a tube on. So it, it hits a, a tube against a spring and in that way it kind of shakes it back and forth really quickly. Cleaning up our samples from that point we needed to use a centrifuge and we didn't have anything that we could plug into mains power. So we used a Dremel drill which we could charge from our solar panels and a 3D printed attachment where we could put our tubes in and spin it. Um, of course we couldn't determine the RPM or anything specific so we just did everything by eye at that point. So we have 65 nanograms per microliter of DNA. We need a threshold of DNA to start our nanopore sequencing and we've hit that. So let's get sequencing. With the purified DNA, we just added it to the field kit from Nanopore and, and it was pretty simple after that point. The biggest challenge with this expedition was keeping the flow cells warm and for that we used our own body heat. It seemed to be the most consistent source of heat uh, on an ice cap. We could control the temperature by determining kind of which layer of clothing it was in. Um, if you really needed to warm it up, have it right up against the skin. If you needed to make it a bit cooler, we could put it on the outer layers. And even some days were so warm that I could just have them uh, out in the open. But fundamentally, we had to, for 11 days, keep all of the flow cells at a consistent above zero temperature. One of the problems we faced, which was unexpected, is that the flow cells got too hot at one point. It really says something about the sleeping bags we were using that really rated to, to really low temperatures. And at one point, the flow cells did go above 30 degrees. So bizarrely, we were finding the opposite problem more than them getting too cold. We were doing all of our sequencing powered by solar energy and so we really wanted to demonstrate how long we could keep that going for. And we managed to do a cumulative run of 24 hours across two different flow cells, doing the base calling separately. We did the sequencing run on a sort of normal Windows laptop with the Minion attached to that. We then had that plugged into a battery pack which in turn was being charged by a solar panel all at the same time. And that took us all the way through the day and then through the night we decided to use two other separate battery packs to keep the laptop charged. We decided not to do any base calling live so we could save a bit of energy in that sense as well. So we had two main findings from this experiment. One was we were surprised at the level of diversity of microorganisms that we could identify. And we found thousands of different species from thousands of different phyla and orders and, and that sort of thing. Equally interesting to us was that 56% of the data we generated didn't align to the NCBI database, suggesting that there was just a lot of organisms and a lot of DNA there that we, we don't recognize. This is really interesting to us because there's a natural bias for us as researchers to do most of our scientific work in the vicinity of research stations. So by taking this fully off grid, we think that there's a huge unexplored pool of microorganisms that exist in extreme environments that aren't easily accessible. In terms of the cryosphere in polar regions, we're really only starting to understand the role that microorganisms play. Uh, they play a role in the melting of the ice by changing the reflectivity of the ice surface. And so understanding which microorganisms are there and their role that they're playing is an important process in understanding our climate.